Hi, this is Kimberly. Today's video will feature Dr. John Potts, a doctor who saw Layla and Millie, a pediatrician actually, and Millie and her other two remaining sisters. All Tess is their biological mother and they have been adopted all together in the same home, which just fills my heart. I'm so glad. Their mother will be speaking today, and I'm just going to do a separate commentary because this video runs just over an hour and a half, and then there's those that don't want to hear me talking at all. I may just do separate commentary from here on out, just post the courtroom the way they do on court TV, and then I'll have separate commentary. I have stuff to say about this testimony today. So if there's lag time between posting the courtroom stuff and me talking about it, be patient. You know I'm a procrastinator. You know I have CRS, can't remember shit, things like that. So, got it. Love you. So I'm going to keep this short and sweet. And of course, I've cut out long breaks and pauses. There's timestamps below in the description. Much love and peace. Enjoy the video. Thank you for listening. How soon after meeting Millie did Millie come to live with you? She came to live with me that day. She pulled up in the yard. Peggy Jacob, which is Millie's biological father, got the car, got her, got in the car, and I immediately called 911. This is her just having found Papa shoes. That's what she would call us, is Papa and Mama. Well, that's what it says here. What does it say there? Foster mother shared that Layla appears to have anger problems. And she told you that Layla bites and scratches her older sister and her foster siblings when she is mad. Yes. And she appears to have anger problems, especially related to food. Yes. You say that the grandmother, Peggy Banks, lies. Yes. You telling her that Peggy is a spiteful woman. Yes. When Layla, if Layla had vitamin C, did you ever see anything like that? No, sir. Do you have to object to this line of questioning? Close her up on the back. I just apologize to have to do this to you. Did you see anything like that on Layla? No, sir. Did you ever happen to see anything like that on Layla? No, sir. Nothing further. Um, this area, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Is that a mark that you've seen before? No, that wasn't there when she was with me. I do. Thank you. If you could please state your name for the record. Uh, John Potts. And Dr. Potts, how are you employed? Self-employed in uh, Fayetteville and Petrie, Fayetteville and Hampton now. And how are you employed? A pediatrician. And do you have your own? Yes. How long have you held your own practice? Since 1978. And in the, those years from 1978 to today, have you, have you always worked in pediatrics? Yes. Prior to opening um, your own practice in 1978, how were you employed? I worked from 76 to 78 with uh, Dr. Alan Sievert in East Point. Uh, before that, I was in the uh, U.S. Navy for two years and then residency before that. And what was your residency in? Uh, pediatrics. Now, in practice, is it customary to write or document um, every time a child comes in? Yes. And is it customary to document the reasons why a child is coming to see you? Yes. Is it also your practice um, to document any concerns you may have regarding child abuse? Yes. Yes. And are you a mandated reporter? I think I understand what you mean. <laughs> yes. And what does that mean? I think it means that if I see abuse, I should report it. I'm obligated legally to report it. Is there ever a time that you've had suspicions or concerns of child abuse as it related to one of your patients? Yes, uh, a number of times. And did you document your concerns in those cases? Yes. Yes. Did you ever treat a patient by the name of Layla Daniel for the date of birth of July 18, 2013? Yes. How many times did you see Layla? She was seen in her office four times. And were those four visits um, documented? 
Yes. Yes, as an eight-day-old. It was an after-delivery uh, checkup. What is a, wild, a well child check? It's when you see the child for a scheduled well child exam as a, in contrasted to a sick visit, like with fever. And at the time that you saw Layla on July 26, 2013, how much did she weigh? She, uh, I can look, but I think I remember seven pounds, 12 ounces. Her birth weight was seven pounds, 10 ounces. And what was her height? I'll have to look. I don't remember that. Dr. Potts, um, previous to today, you had taken some notes to kind of summarize um, Layla's medical chart. Yes. Would those assist you in um, discussing her medical history today? Uh, Yes, it would help. And do you have those with you? Yes. And uh, just to make sure that we are, we did provide a copy of these to the defense. Are these the two, the two summaries that you are using? Yes. Uh, yeah, these are two of the summaries, yes. And these are per? Uh, this is a, just a summary of both of them. This is Layla's. I will mark um, for identification purposes the summary for both children as one of six and the summary for Layla as one of seven. And looking at your summary, are you able to, to tell us how tall Layla was at the time? Uh, her, her length was 20 and a half inches. And on July 26th of 2013, did you conduct a full body exam of Layla? Yes. Do you have any concerns with regards to Layla at that time? No. No. And who um, brought Layla in on July 26th? Uh, from my notes, it appears that the mother did. It said, Mom plans to formula feed. When was the next time that you saw Layla? The, the next visit was 5-16-2014. Uh, uh, so almost, almost a year later? Uh, nine months, nine roughly. Months. Uh, she came in because of a rash. And what type of rash did she have? Uh, I did not see her. Somebody in my office saw her, and it, it was classical of hand, foot, and mouth disease. And what is hand, foot, and mouth disease? It's a Coxsackie virus that you get little red bumps in a number of places, uh, but primarily the mouth, the hands, the feet, but it can be pretty widely spread at times. It's very common. And how does one uh, get cancer? You'd catch it from someone else, probably another child. And during that, when a, ch well, when a child comes in with a rash, as mm -hmm. Layla did on May 16, 2014, uh, is it customary for you to observe the child without their clothing? Yes. I did not see her. The, the note was just the vesicles on the palms, the soles, and the mouth. So I, I assume that he did, but I, I did not see her. On that May 16, 2014 note, was there any other concerns regarding Layla? Dr. No, and they did not do a, a weight check because uh, they don't usually on sick visits unless they're throwing up or having diarrhea. August 19th, 2014, so it was uh, about eight months later. No, it was no three, mo uh, three months later, eight, 1914. And what was the purpose of Layla's visit on August 19th, 2014? Uh, she was here for uh, a well checkup uh, and uh, a well checkup. Did she get any shots? 
she did. Uh, she had been the only shot she had gotten since birth was the one in the hospital, hepatitis B shot. At our office that day, she got uh, about five shots. The exam was totally normal, and again, Ron Thompson saw her then, except there was a, a small red nodule on the right labial area that he thought might be either chronic infection or something called a hemangioma. Uh, he did not feel like it needed to be treated. Uh, he referred her to a dermatologist. What is a hemangioma? It's a collection of blood vessels. We use terms like strawberry birthmark, things of that nature. It doesn't have to be there at birth. Uh, usually, though, within the first year of life, it appears. A child can be born without one and then yeah. get one. And it, does, do the um, hemangiomas disappear at all or resolve themselves? Uh, the vast majority of them uh, disappear on their own and sometimes pretty quickly. And is there anything that, um, about a hemangioma that would uh, be cause for concern? For no. No, uh, there was n no uh, indication of bruising, and but uh, again, he he said it might be a hemangioma. So he, that, that. Was um, Layla's blood or hemoglobin tested on August nineteen of twenty fourteen? Yes, and it was normal. It was eleven point six. And is it customary to test a child's blood? In our practice, we check it at nine months, and then at two, and yearly after that. Uh, she apparently, from what we could tell, did not have a nine-month well checkup, so we, that's why we did it at the 13-month checkup. If a child had a low hemoglobin result, um, what would that mean? Uh, it could mean uh, that they were not taking in enough iron in their diet or they were not absorbing it normally. Usually they're not taking in enough iron. and It's not real uncommon. No, no, none whatsoever. The fourth and final visit was uh, April the 30th, 2015. And that was for a 21 month well checkup, which is, we normally do it at 18 and 24 months, but she came in a little bit late. Uh, the exam was normal except for a runny nose. Uh, she had been seen by a pediatrician or a physician somewhere else and been put on Amoxil. Uh, I can told her to finish the Amoxil and I added Claritin and five days of something called Orpred. And that was the last time that we saw her, but the, the exam was normal. And during that visit, did you um, check Layla from head to toe? Yes. And on April 30th of 2015, you didn't have any concerns about the child? No. No, not at, not at all. Now, on May 11 of 2015, were Layla's records um, sent to Eagle Land, Eagle's Landing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Who made that request? Uh, the uh, legal guardians, whoever that was. Now, one, one, uh, on the uh, August 19th visit, uh, we had a note that she was staying at that time with guardians. Did Layla have less than the recommended well checks? Yes, uh -huh. unless she was getting them somewhere that we were not aware of. So it's possible she was getting them somewhere else. Yeah, but uh, it seemed to be clear that she, would not get, she was not getting shots, which would be the main reason to get the well checkups. So she probably was not getting the, shot, the checkups. Uh, yeah, the, the, our records showed she got one at two days of age, which had to be in the hospital, and then she got, uh, may I look at the records? Uh, she got several from us on that August 19th, 2014 visit. 
uh, they left our practice uh, around the first day of May. She got uh, one, two, three. She got five shots uh, on the 18th of May of that year, and then she got three shots uh, on the 29th of June of that year. Somewhere else. They're supposed to put all shots uh, from any office or health department in uh, something called GRITS, uh, which is a, a registers all the shots given to anybody in the state of Georgia. And that's something that you as a doctor have access to? Yes. Uh -huh. As of November 2015, would Layla have been current on her shots? See, that would make her, it'd make her, what, two years and three months? Uh, it appears to, I'd have to, it appears to, yeah. So other than keeping up with well checks, did you have any other concerns regarding Lail? No. Uh -huh. Now, do you actually have an independent memory of Layla visiting the office? Not honestly. Uh -huh. So there's nothing about Layla's visits that stood out in your memory? No. So they're pretty standard? Yes. And Doctor, do you have your notes for on Millie as well? Yes, uh huh. And would you like to use those when talking about her history with your office? I can use them partly at least. You can use them what? I can use them some and not use them some, uh -huh. depending on the question. We saw Millie 22 times. Uh, some of those may have just been for vaccinations that the provider actually didn't see her. And how many times did you see Millie in 2012? One, two, three. Seven times. And what were the dates that you saw Millie in okay. 2012? Uh, one, six, uh, 12, two, 14, 12, three, one, 12, Five, fourteen, twelve, seven, ten, twelve, ten, nine, twelve, twelve, nineteen, twelve. In Millie's records for the year 2012, was there any concerns of child abuse? No. Uh, and during Millie's 2012 visits, would she have been checked from head to toe? Yes. Now, in 2013, how many times did your practice see Millie? Uh, one, two, three, uh, three times. And what were those dates? Uh, one, ten, thirteen, three, seven, thirteen, and nine, eleven, thirteen. And in 2013, was there any concern uh, for child abuse noted in Millie's charts? No. Uh -uh. And would Millie have been checked head to toe? Yes. How many times did you see Millie in 2014? Uh, just one time. Six three fourteen. And why did you see her on six three fourteen? Uh, in my summary, she had vomiting and diarrhea. I can pull up the actual visit if you want. That's okay. Um, let me ask you this: Was there any concern on that visit for um, child abuse? No. Now, in twenty fifteen, how many times did your office see her? Uh, two times. Four four fifteen and four thirty fifteen. Give me those dates again. Oh, four four at four four and four thirty. And on those visits was Millie checked head to toe. Uh, four four she was given a shot by the nurse, so no. Uh, four thirty uh, she was in for a sick visit, so probably we didn't she didn't take her uh, panties off, but we did. I did check from the waist up. Uh, she was there for a cough and a runny nose. And on May 11, 2015, uh, did you transfer Millie's records? Yes. And was that also to Eagle's Landing? I assume so. In 2016, though, you saw Millie how many times? 
four times. And what were those dates? Seven, seven, ten, seventeen, twelve, eight, and twelve, fourteen. And were, on those dates, was there any concern for child abuse? No. Then in 2017, how many times did you see him? Uh, I, I believe it was five times. And do you have those dates as well? Uh, one twenty nine, three twenty seven, five one, seven five, eleven nine, and eleven twenty seven. Did I count wrong? No, yeah, no, I, I, one, two, three, four, uh, five times, yeah, but I, there wasn't a one twenty nine. Yes. November the 9th, uh, a swollen ankle. The, uh, the provider, who was not me, felt like it was a mildly sprained ankle. She was seen uh, 18 days later, 17 days later, and uh, the ankle sprain was gone, ankle swelling. Why was she seen uh, 17 to 18 days later? Uh, for a, a cough and runny nose and fever. Is there a reason given for the ankle pain? Let me pull. Let me pull that up. It just said Millie presents with ankle swelling, right ankle. Again, the day before the precipitating event appears to have been running, although the actual mechanism of injury was unknown. Uh, this is the third time within the past month that she has done this to the same ankle. Uh, on the on the playground, and they just treated with uh, just rest and ice and uh, ibuprofen. Now, in 2017, did you have any concerns for? No, abuse? no. Is there anything about Millie's visits that stood out in your memory? Uh, any of the visits? No, she was sitting at, at a. Four months of age, she had two small impetigenous lesions on her shoulder uh, that was treated with a topical antibiotic ointment. And she had a mild bacterial infection uh, that was resolving uh, at seven months and at, I believe, 15 months that was treated with an oral antibiotic. But no, no evidence that we saw of child abuse. Uh, Empatigo is a superficial bacterial infection that's common in children, uh, particularly in the summertime. And does it go away with treatment? Uh, it's always best to treat it. Sometimes it'll go away just with good hygiene. And you also noted that she came in with, a couple times with a mild bacterial infection. Yeah, that was when she was seven months and when she was 15 months. Yeah, it, it, it was a little vesicular, a little bumpy thing. Uh, and is that a common infection of children that age? Uh, yeah. It's, it, you see it, it's not uncommon. And how is that treated? Uh, usually with either topical or oral antibiotic or, or both. <clears throat> Did you ever see uh, Millie place in your practice? Uh, ask the question again, the times. The, the day range I'm asking about is July 24, 2015 to November 17, 2015. No, uh, we saw her 4 30, 15, and the next time we saw her was uh, July of 16. July of 2016. 2016, yeah. Uh, you mean Millie or Layla? Layla. Layla. Last time we saw her uh, was 4 30 15. Doctor, you had mentioned some rashes um, or infections that the girl has. And I'll show you a previously been marked as states exhibit 70. Those rashes you were describing, does this appear in Layla's rashes? If you look behind you, you'll see it on. Okay. Uh, 
No, it didn't. What we saw does not look like any of that. No, no. Yes, we would have been obligated to. And as to states exhibit 78, if you saw that injury with no explanation, would you have had to do a report? Yes. After as to states 45, if you had seen these injuries on a child, would you have made a report? Yes. Yes. Thank you for the question. Okay, Cross. Good afternoon, Dr. Cross. My name is Glenn Mall. I have a number of questions I'd like to ask you before we go on. I wanted to ask you about the visit of 7 26, 2013. Okay. And at that visit, it was not true the child came in for congestion and constipation, correct? Yes. And the mother said that sometimes the child gasps as, she, as if she cannot breathe. Yes. And that was her mother who said that. Yes. And um, I want to turn to December 14, 2016. And this would be for million. Okay. You said December fourteenth. December fourteenth. Twenty sixteen. Okay. Twenty sixteen. Mm-hmm. Who brought her in at that time? Um Oh, I'm pretty sure it's the great grandmother, but let me see. If, um, the uh, great grandmother. She was concerned about her uh, being uh, significantly hyperactive and not able to control her at home. And did she in fact say that she, did you in fact write that she was desperate because child is lying, impulsive, and argumentative? Uh, the main problems she's having currently include fidgeting, inability to stay seated in class and attentiveness, inability to stay on task, impulsivity, forgetfulness, refusal to do assigned task at home, and argumentative temperament with parents. And other problems include lying. Yes? In fact, you wrote the great-grandmother desperate because child is lying. Uh, I said uh, great-grandmother uh, great grandmother is desperate. I didn't say it didn't add to that. But you said she was desperate. Yes. She wasn't desperate for any other reason. She was desperate because the child was lying and argumentative. Because of the behavior, yes. The behavior. 
and she told you that she saw this behavior two years ago when she had her, and she's seen it again. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we will turn to March 9, 2018. Who brought her? March 9th of 2. 3 9, 2018. I think we saw her. We didn't see her in 18 that hour. Did she not come in for a swollen ankle, which was the third time in the past month? Uh, not in 18. It was. Uh, it was eleven nine seventeen. Eleven nine seventeen. Yes. Uh -huh. Swollen ankle. Yes. Third time within the past month. Yes, that's what they said. We that's the only time we saw her. And uh, that was when you say that's what they said. Who's they? Let me look back and see. Eleven nine seventeen. Let me read it out to you. And actually, I didn't. I wasn't the one that saw it. It says, Millie presents with ankle swelling. It's primarily in the right ankle. Swelling is noted to be mild. It began yesterday. The precipitating event appears to have been running, although the actual mechanism of injury is unknown. This is the third time within the past month that she has done this to the same ankle. Injured initially four weeks ago on the playground. Twisted it, treated with... Uh, uh, Rice, RICE, and Motrin, no improvement, keeps re it. Uh, and, and the provider felt like it was a, a mild sprain, uh, treated it with rest and ice elevation, and told her to continue to take uh, an ibuprofen. And then when I saw her, uh, that was the ninth when I saw her on the 27th, uh, there, was no, there was no swelling of the ankle, no complaints of the ankle. Did you, in fact, order um, trace to be taken? I saw that in the report, and, and I don't know if it was actually done or not. So, but you ordered it? Uh, the, uh, the provider ordered it, yes. Yeah, it, it's Millie, uh, it said some swelling, uh, but I don't see any fracture. But yeah, this was apparently, and this was done uh, November 9th, so it was done the same day. Okay. And those, is that an order for an x-ray? Uh, yes, uh-huh. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to look. Yeah, it's yeah, it is an order for the next one. To the, I, was it the great grandmother? I, I'm thinking it was the great grandmother, but I'm not sure. It's not noted on that, is it? And Dr. Potter, you said that the children injured themselves all through their childhood. Yes, right? uh -huh. um, Some children are rougher than others. Absolutely. Some are more rough and tumble. Yes. And uh, some are very adventuresome and mm -hmm. pile chairs on top of beds and try to reach fans and yeah. that sort of thing and fall down, don't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to hear. Thank you, Rep. Thank you, Rep. Yeah. I'm surprised the mild swelling of an ankle consistent with um, running up the playground and twisting an ankle. Yes, sir. And do you see that often with um, young children? Yes. Uh, no. Would you consider that consistent with climbing up some chairs and playing with the hands on the foundation? 
No, I don't think so. I think it would be more likely uh, some type of abuse, but I couldn't rule it out of every situation. You couldn't rule out that it was uh, from a fall from a, a ladder hitting so, the rungs as she's going down. I think it would be unlikely, honestly. Okay, but it's possible. It's, it's perhaps possible. Yes, if they were old enough to. Yes. This is the juror that has already technically been removed from the jury. He's, he's not aware of it. Um, we did note that uh, he did not indicate any hardship when we did the general questioning. My concern—it's more of a—it's more of a uh, his uh, behavior and attitude has definitely not been the most respectful towards the proceedings in this particular case. Um, and to a certain extent, you hate to reward uh, that kind of behavior. Um, that being said. They believe in the course discretion as to how we think it's best to proceed. Um, I just we hate to reward behavior where it appears that someone is purposely attempting to get out of jury service. How do you feel like it would uh, infect the rest of the jury? Well, it could. I mean, it could definitely. And the other jurors may say, hey, if I act this way, and I, I have financial hardship, I don't want to be here anymore. Maybe if I act this way, maybe I can get off too. And that's the other concern.
this way. Take it out on me, but not on you. And you, after you spread that, if you would just return it uh, to the book. Yes. And we'll just wait until we get the rest of the Okay, uh, this is a lengthy note, and uh, it's uh, five parts. Uh, so, what I'm going to do is uh, use the same procedure I did with the last one, which is uh, mark it. I'm going to give it to counsel to read, and then we'll discuss it. In segments. Uh, let's start with uh, number one. It says, uh, Will there be an opportunity to review the indictment in full? Uh, will this happen during deliberation? The answer, of course, is yes. Uh, will this happen during deliberation? They'll have a copy of it during deliberation. I suppose I can answer in writing by saying that. Any objection? No objection, one statement. Two, will the jurors be given an explanation of the terms referenced in the indictment? Yes. During the charge of the court, uh, which will occur after closing arguments. That's all. Yes. Three, will there be any reference information to be used outside of the notes taken by jurors? May our notes be shared during deliberation? <coughs> This is a little bit of a trickier question because I'm not sure that I understand exactly what he means by reference information. I think that the answer is no. Uh, the case will be decided on the evidence presented and the charge of the court. Uh, and the, uh, as it relates to the notes issue, they may use notes to refresh their recollection, but each of the jurors must decide this case on their own. I don't, know, I don't believe that there is uh, anything more that really needs to be said in that regard, uh, but I'm open to any suggestions. Judge, I wonder if um, the way we respond to this is um, you will have the evidence um, that has been um, admitted during the course of the trial and the charge of the court. Um, we will not be permitted to use any outside reference materials. Because I'm not sure from the question this evening, are we going to be able to see all the evidence that's being admitted? And of course, all that will go back, except for the ones that um, have some rule preventing them from going back to the jury. So maybe that would help address, like, yes, you will be able to see, for example, the photographs, those types of things will be back there. But you won't be able to do any other independent research. Um, and I almost wonder if we, if we go to the last question, I almost wonder if the court uh, wants to, it was going to allow him to share this response with the other jurors. I almost wonder if it might be more prudent to um, address any of these concerns to the jurors in open court. That way we know exactly what's being told to them and it's not, there's not a discussion going on in the back. Yeah, I'm happy to, uh, Ms. Mulvey, please. I'm happy to take the note and to read the note and to then share our responses and then send them back. I think that's the best. Yes. Okay. So you prefer that I say yes to the reference material, but to identify the reference material essentially as the evidence. Correct. Okay. So I will say if we're going to be addressing them in open court then perhaps I don't write any responses at all. Say time, that So I'm just simply going to strike through everything that I've written. And we'll uh, bring them out and address all of the questions. Great. Okay, so now we have to uh, determine the best way to deliver the notes. Um, I would suggest that the first thing that we do is address the group. Uh, 
and then after we've addressed the group and have them return to the jury room, then we deliver the, the first note to juror number six. That's fine. Okay. Let's have the jury step out. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. Um, we have a question uh, that's in five parts. Uh, that came from uh, one of the jurors. And, uh, because of the nature of the question, uh, I felt it was important, after conferring with the parties, uh, to speak to you as a group regarding these questions. And so I'm just going to go ahead and do that uh, now. I'm going to read the question and then give you the response. First question is, will there be an opportunity to review the indictment in full? Will this happen during deliberation? Uh, the answer is yes. You will be given a copy of the indictment in full, and you'll be able to review it starting at the beginning of your deliberations. Number two is, will the jurors be given an explanation of the terms referenced in the indictment? It says, for example, assault versus battery and first degree versus second degree, etc. The answer is yes. During the charge of the court, what is the charge of the court? Well, those are my instructions. That's the law that's applicable in the case. So you receive the explanation at that time, and that will occur after the evidence is closed and after the attorneys have made their closing arguments. Okay? Number three, will there be any reference information to be used outside of the notes taken by jurors? May our notes be shared during deliberation? The answer is the only reference information to use the term in the note that you will be permitted to use will be the evidence that has been admitted during the trial of the case. If there have been photos admitted or there have been records admitted then you would have those documents with you. But that would be a reference information. You may not have some of the written statements that are admitted, because that would be a violation of what's called a continuing witness rule. And that will be determined at the conclusion of the case. May your notes be shared during deliberation well, that will be up to you to decide. But each of you are required to decide this case on your own. And how you do that is up to you. Okay? Number four. Will the schedule during deliberation be different than the schedule we are currently using during the trial? No. We expect a nine to five schedule. And you can plan for that. Number five, is it permissible to share the responses to these questions with other jurors? The answer is yes. Um, but I think we've addressed that. All right. Thank you, and you can step back in. Let's step up, three step out. Okay, is the state ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Please call your next witness. The state calls Amanda Harrell. Amanda Carroll. This court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes. And can you please state and spell your name? Amanda Harrell, A-M-A-N-D-A-H-A-R-R-I-L-L. -L. And Ms. Harrell, how do you know Millie Harrell? She's my daughter. And how did she come to be your daughter? Um, I became a foster parent um, in August of 15, and through the course of the time, um, her younger sisters were placed with me, 
and then a little bit more time came, then we were blessed to have her come with us. Why did you become a foster parent? Um, it just kind of presented itself. I had learned um, through a friend more about fostering and um, I was married, I didn't have any kids. Um, and the more I thought about it, I had a loving home to offer and I had a flexible job that gave me a, you know, the freedom to be able to provide what was needed. And then it just kind of took off from there. And before um, Milla's younger sisters, how many foster children did you have? None. They were your first? My first and only. Okay. Now, how old was Millie when she first came to live with you? Six. Six. And how old was Millie's younger sisters when they came to live with you? Um, Carly was uh, just shy of a month, and Hannah was seven weeks, I believe. When was the first time you met Millie? I had met Millie. I don't remember ever seeing her at any court hearings, but I believe the first time I ever met her was when a, our transporter for visitations, um, a few times due to scheduling changes, she would pick Millie up before she would come to get Carly. And I had the opportunity just to briefly meet her in the backseat of the car as I was buckling Carly. When you say um, visitations, what kind of visitations were taking place? Um, the girls had um, visitations with um, either Tessa, you know, or the sisters. You know, eventually we got to where we had, you know, sibling visits, and um, a transporter would pick up uh, Carly from me and then take her to wherever the visits were taking place. And was the transporter someone employed by Defax? Um, I think it was. It was an outside company that Defax employs to do their transporting, and I think they do home studies and stuff as well. Now, how did um, how did you learn of Layla's death? The night that Layla died, I received a call. Um, I believe it was from a caseworker from Henry County or someone from Defax um, requesting the number to my foster agency's uh, emergency intake line. Um, during that call, they did say that um, Carly's sister, you know, had tragically passed away and that they were looking for possibly emergency placements of Millie. Um, they asked if I would take her and I said yes. Um, and then that was the end of it. Yeah. At the time of that phone call, had you met Millie those few times with the transporter? Yes. Oh, no, no, no. I, no, I had not. No. Okay. So at the time of that phone call, you had not met Millie no. at all? No. Carly had only been with me maybe five weeks. And after those first few um, interactions, brief interactions with the transporter, when is the next time you met Millie? I, I might have seen her in court, but I, I don't think so. Um, in July of 17, we um, visit schedules kind of changed and um, we moved the visit. The, the, at this point, it was a sibling visit and we moved the location to my house. And then so Millie started coming to visitations at my house. So what happened between the phone call you got on November 17, 2015, asking you if you would take Millie and July 2017? I asked that a lot too. Um, when I agreed, it was obviously things were chaos. It was late at night. Um, I didn't hear back from them. Um, and so of course I am, frantically trying to figure out what's about to happen and am I now gonna, you know, am I making changes for, you know, room for a four-year-old? Um, and as I waited and waited and I, things kind of changed and then all of a sudden DFAX came back and had a concern because I had a pool, I had dogs and um, they wanted those things addressed. So by, you know, then my dogs were cleared and everything was fine and then I had to add an additional fence to the pool and by the time I was able to get that taken care of, um, Millie had already been placed in another home, so they said she's gonna stay where she is. And how, um, how did it come about that after July of 2017, Millie actually ended up with you after being placed somewhere else? Um, my understanding is she went to a couple different places in between a couple phone calls I got asking if she could come you know, live with us. I always said yes when I got that phone call. Um, and then sibling visits started 
um, at our house. Um, and, you know, defects had kind of started talking about permanent placements and what that was going to look like and wanting the sisters together. Um, and then she came to visit. We took her on a family vacation with us. And at that point, um, she was placed with Peggy Banks. And when we got back from our Thanksgiving vacation to the beach, when I was transitioning Millie back to Peggy, she mentioned that she felt that um, Christmas or winter break would be a good time for Millie to transition into my home. And step back a little. You went on a family vacation with the three girls in yes. November of 2017? Yes, we invited um, Millie to go with us. And at that time, where was Millie living? With Peggy Banks. And when you, whose um, idea was it at that time for Millie to transition to live in your home? Um, I wanted her the, you know, the entire time, but um, it wasn't until there was, um, Peggy was wanting her to stay with her, but then she mentioned it um, she knew that I, obviously I was open to it and wanted that to happen, um, but then she had changed her mind and thought that that was what was best for Millie. When did Millie officially move into your home? Um, she officially moved in on December 27th of 17. And did you spend that Christmas with Millie? I did. Christmas is very big to our family, so I wanted to make sure she was with us. And after December 27 of 2017, um, was Millie permanently with you up until yes. this time? Yes. And were you present for the um, hearing regarding the termination of Tessa's parental rights and the, the father's? Mm -hmm. And when was, what was that date? June 8th. Of what year? Oh, of, of 18. And what was the date that Millie and her sisters were officially adopted? 3-18-19. Now, at the time that Millie began to live with you on in December of 2017, how old was she? Six. And at that time, what, if anything, did you know about Millie's first six years of her life? I didn't know a, a, a lot of information. I knew um, she had been in several different places. Um, obviously, I knew I had heard that she was um, in the home where her sister passed away, um, that, you know, there was, you know, potentially, you know, some issues that she may have been through, um, just trauma in general from all of the moving, things that she had experienced and been a part of, um, but that was about it. Did you know anything about Millie's medical history prior to um, her coming to stay with you? Mm -hmm. and, and how come you didn't have any of her medical history? Um, well. I'm not actually, you know, privy to that information until she's technically placed in my home. But even when she was placed with me, um, any medical information was hard to get. Anything when she, her time in Henry County, I was just told that no one could access that information, so they had nothing to give to me. But that when she was adopted, then I would have all medical records. And at this time, have you been able to get all of Millie's medical records? No, I have very spotty records and were you were you at the time that you adopted or started fostering Millie uh, were you able to get any of the defects records no did you know um, Tessa Daniel prior to fostering Millie and her sisters no did you know Millie or her sister's biological fathers prior to fostering Millie and her sisters no. and did you know Peggy pa Peggy Banks prior to fostering Millie no since fostering um, Millie and then adopting Millie, have you um, met Tessa? Okay. Um, oh, sorry, briefly, Tessa um, yes, yes, briefly in uh, court. We have had uh, email conversations. And since fostering and adopting Millie, have you had um, conversations with Peggy Max? Yes. Now, when Millie first came to live with you, um, what kind of child was she? Um, sweet, energetic, um, you know, we, she had trust issues. She had a very hard time just trusting almost anything. Um, I think rightfully so. Um, she, um, loved being with her sisters and was great to, you know, help take care of them, you know, per se. Um, you know, she would have some attention seeking behaviors. 
um, I think coming now all of a sudden being back in the oldest of two and, um, you know, just wanting to have my attention, you know, at times and as I think a typical six year old will do, they'll get it any way they can get it. And what kind of things would she do to get your behavior? Um, she would just, um, you know, wouldn't maybe do something when I asked her to do it or um, if I would tell her to go brush her teeth or get in the shower or, you know, pick up her clothes or her toys. Um, or she would tell me she did do those things. And then I would, you know, of course, come to find the clothes still on the floor or her toothbrush was dry, um, you know, things like that. What does Millie do or how does she act when she gets nervous? She um, gets this kind of funnier, you know, giggle, laugh. Um, she tends to make grand gestures when she's lying um, and um, she talks. She either goes really quiet or she tries to over talk. So you've seen Millie do a, a giggle or a laugh when she gets nervous? Yes. Now, how often um, have you and Millie talked about the death of her sister, Layla, as well as Millie's experiences at the Rosenbaums? Um, very rarely. It's definitely something that she does not want to talk about. I don't push the issue. Uh, we talk about Layla all the time, we, um, but we just don't talk about her experiences. When you talk about Layla, what kind of things are you talking about? Um, talk, she'll tell me about things that Layla liked to do, you know, what she was like, and, um, you know, she'll just, like, you know, tell stories of they would read, you know, she would read a book, you know, to Layla, those kind of things. Um, and how come um, Millie doesn't like talking about the, her experience at the Rosa Homes? I would object. That's a question that can't be answered by the party. Why Millie uh, would do something would feel a certain way that's asking for speculation. The witness may have first-hand knowledge from Millie. Uh, I'll sustain the objection. Now, has Millie ever told you anything about what happened to her while living at the Rosenbaum's? Um, she has made um, a couple brief statements, um, you know, throughout the course of our time together. Now, how would these statements begin? How would they come up? Very, very random. Um, you know, looking back, I still can't ever think about how it would come up. We may just be in the car and she would just make a statement. Um, or we might be talking about something, you know, that we want for dinner and then she'll go into why she doesn't want something. Um, but then she makes a statement and moves on. Have you ever asked her directly about what happened at the Rosenbaum? No. And when Millie would make these statements, would you ask her questions? No. What exactly has Millie told you about what happened to her at the Rosenbaum's? She's, um, I think, mentioned four different things that had happened. Um, one of them being that um, she and Layla would get in trouble if they fell asleep in the car and they would receive spankings if they, um, they would get in trouble and or receive spankings if they ever fell asleep in the car. Did she tell you anything else? She said um, at one time she wasn't doing something fast enough, so Jennifer twisted her ankle and sat on her. And when she told you this, did you ask her any more questions? I didn't because I don't, I have no information as to what happened. And I, I mean, never having you know, a child this age, especially a child of trauma, I didn't want to ever make it worse. I didn't want to make her talk about something because when she would make these statements, it was a one and done. She would say it and before she could finish that sentence, she had already changed the subject and it was clear she did not want to talk about it. And what was the, the fourth thing that she told you about? Being okay, uh, thinkings, um, but she had said um, at one point she, um, that she was forced to eat mashed potatoes until she vomited and then was forced to eat the vomit. And how did that statement come up? Um, we were talking about things um, 
always trying to come up with different things to have for dinner um, becomes challenging that you have three kids that will eat. Um, so I'm always trying to get them to tell me things that they like, because if they tell me they like it, then they can't sit at the table and tell me they don't. And so we talked about potatoes and, you know, does she like potatoes of any kind? And she said, no. And that's when this topic of mm -hmm. mashed potatoes came up. Mm -hmm. Now, other than what Millie has told you, do you know anything else about um, how Millie was injured at the Rosenbaum's? No. And other than um, what Millie has told you, do you know anything else about Layla's death? Um, you know, obviously when this first happens, um, you know, I definitely followed along any media coverage, any, you know, articles in the newspaper, you know, anything that was published, you know, when it happened. Have you ever um, told Millie about what you've learned in the media? No. Now, you've been in the courtroom for most of this trial, mm -hmm. and at any point, have you gone home and told Millie about what you've heard in court? No. Have you ever gone home and questioned Millie about things that were said in court? No. One thing, I do want to say one thing. We did talk about like procedural. You know, she would ask what happened and I would be like, we selected a jury today. Or we listened to people talk, but never anything that was said. But we did talk about like picking jury. And why have you been in the courtroom for most of the trial? Because I'm her mother. And have you um, been able to learn some information about Millie's past since being in the courtroom? Mm -hmm. And is that important to you? Very. Okay. It's hard to not know what your child's been through. Now, at the time that Millie came to live with you, was she seeing a therapist named Ann McCall? She was. And when Millie came to live with you, did you continue to take her to see Ann? I did. And was there a time when you, Millie, and Millie's great-grandmother, Peggy Panks, um, mm -hmm. met with Miss McCullough? We did. And how did that meeting come about? Um, in just kind of passing, I felt that Millie may see Peggy and I, you know, having kind of a loyalty issue. And I thought that if she could see Peggy and I together as a united front, wanting nothing but the best for her, that might help her, you know, just feel better, you know, just when she gets uneven about things and the transition. And during that meeting, um, did you go through um, Millie's different placements with her? Yes, because I had no, you know, co or concrete uh, knowledge of her background. And was Peggy Banks the one that kind of gave you that information? She did. Mm -hmm. And during that meeting, did you ever discuss or Millie ever talk about her time at the Rosenbaum's? Mm -hmm. not, not, we just, that wasn't talked about when I, in the sessions that I was part of, other than their place in the timeline. Why did, um, well at some point did Millie stop seeing Ann McCullough? Yes, um, Ann's office is in McDonough. We live in Noonan. Um, so it just wasn't, after a while, it just became troublesome to drive that far, you know, each and every week when I could find something closer. And how far was the drive from your place to Ann's? Um, I think it was about an hour. We would come from different places from school or whatnot, but I think it was roughly an hour. And you would be doing that about once a week? Mm -hmm. Do you know if Millie told Ann about anything about the death of her sister? I believe she did, yes. But you don't know on this I don't know any specifics as to what was said. Do you know what, if anything, Millie told Anne about living, herself living with the Rosenbaums, her experience? I know that she did, but I don't know the specifics as to what she said. When did Millie stop seeing Anne? I believe it was in March of 18. After March of 2018, did Millie um, see another therapist? Um, a couple months later, we did. We started up with one closer to home. So that would be approximately May of 2018. Um, I believe we started in July, July of 18. And what was the reason that you <coughs> took Millie to see um, Donna, the, the other therapist? Um, you know, honestly, I just she had been, you know, in counseling for, you know, so long. Um, 
you know, what little I did hear about what she had been through, I felt anyone would need continued counseling and therapy. And so I felt it was best to continue what she had already been. And doing. at that time, um, did you ha were you also seeking some guidance or help in how to to parent a six year old? Yes. Um, you know, my situation is a little bit more unique. I didn't have any children of my own before I started fostering. So I was learning day by day um, as the little ones were um, getting older. And then when Millie came, I had never parented a three, a four, a five, or a six year old, let alone a child with trauma in her history that I wanted to make sure that I was doing it right. And I wasn't, you know, I don't think any parent knows what they're doing, but I wanted to, I wanted to make sure I was overly cautious that I wasn't going to cause her any trauma or anything like that. And how often would Millie see Donna? Um, I would say um, on average three, uh, three times a month, you know, schedules would come up and, you know, but I would say on average three times. What if any concerns did you bring to Donna's attention? Um, Similar to the ones I, you know, mentioned before, you know, attention-seeking behaviors, um, getting into, you know, really telling lies and just, you know, why not brush your teeth? You know, how do I, you know, turn this around so we can, you know, just get to doing things maybe the first or second time I ask her to do it versus the fifth or sixth. And was Donna able to um, teach you some techniques on how to handle or parent a six-year-old? Yeah, she would always have, you know, ideas for whatever. Because I would just ask, almost any time she came, I would have some sort of scenario that I'd be like, what do you think? So she came. Um, where did the sessions take she place? She would come to the house. She came to our house. Now, was there a time that Millie discussed um, Layla's death at school? Yes. Okay. And was that brought to your attention? It was. And was this um, discussion brought to Donna's attention? It was. And how come you brought it to Donna's attention? Um, because Millie doesn't talk about what happens. So any time she does, you know, I feel the door is open and I want to know, is there a reason, like, was there a trigger that brought her that wanted to talk about it? What caused it? And if she wanted to talk about it now, I wanted to make sure she had the avenues to do it in the best way for her. Did you talk to Millie about um, that conversation she had at school about Layla's death? I did. Okay. And was Millie able to tell you why um, she discussed Layla's death? Um, it started with um, a prayer request at school that morning. And, um, you know, there was, you know, some of her classmates were sharing, you know, um, a passing of a grandparent or a, a sick family member. And I think she, want, she wanted to participate in the conversation. And why was this conversation concerning to you? Um, it's very heavy information for children. Um, I was you know, concerned that Millie was now wanting to talk about it, but unfortunately it wasn't with appropriate people. And what exactly did Millie say to her classmates? Um, she told them that her sister was killed. Um, I think that it kind of had come up in multiple times throughout the day. So um, I may not have the order of what was said and when, but um, I was told that she had said that her sister was killed. Um, her sister had been choked, at one point choked on chicken, that um, her, uh, I believe she said organs had been split in two. And or cut in half, maybe. Cut in half, okay. And when you first approached Millie about what she had told her classmates, um, did she deny that she had said it? Yes. Okay. Um, and at that point, did you have a conversation with her about being honest with you? Yes. And at that point, at some point, did she eventually tell you? Eventually. Mm-hmm. And during that conversation, uh, well, let me ask you this, is Millie, um, in your experience, able to distinguish what she's heard and what she's personally observed with her own eyes? 
I think so. As based on her personal knowledge. Was Millie able to tell you how she knew the information that she told you about her sister's death? Um, when it kind of came down to it, she was like, well, I think I heard that. And as of today's date, does Millie still continue to see Donna? Yes, she does. And do you at all know um, Jennifer Rosenbaum? No, I do not. And do you at all know um, Joseph Rosenbaum? No. Do you have any relationship with any of Millie or her other sister's family members? No. Thank you. No more questions. <laughs> Good morning, Ms. Harrell. I just have a number of questions for you. My name is Corrine Mo. You've been sitting in the courtroom since the beginning of trial, haven't you? I have. So you've heard what all the witnesses have said. Mm -hmm. You've seen all the pictures. You have listened to all. You have seen all the exhibits, exhibits that have been yes. filed. And it's true, isn't it, that when you... Excuse me, just a second. Um, you had an occasion with Millie where Hannah, and Hannah is Mercy, isn't it? Yes. That was her name mm -hmm. uh, by her biological mother was Mercy. Yes. And uh, she's now Hannah. She is. There was a time where you were you were exposed to the fact that Hannah fell down or hurt herself, was pushed, had some bru bruising, and that Millie was the one who had pushed her, correct? I don't remember that specifically. You don't remember, you don't remember ever coming, reporting to DFACS that Hannah had gotten hurt and you, not, none of the girls would tell you how it happened. She kept- Oh, okay, I know, yes. So that, that did happen? Yes. Okay, and so um, none of the girls would tell you what happened, including Millie. And in the beginning, in the beginning, and then uh, ultimately she fessed up to the fact that she had lied. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. And you've had lots of diaper rashes with the, the girls that you have now, the two younger ones, sisters of Millie. Carly yes. had, had several diaper rashes. Okay. Now, with regards to Donna Wazorek, it's fair to say, isn't it, that basically she was she was brought into the picture to help Millie prepare for trial. No. No. That is something that would have been discussed, but that's not the reason. So that was not one of one of the reasons. No. And isn't it true that Donna Wazorek has attempted to prepare her for trial? Depends on what you mean by prepare. They have talked about it, that she needs to get up here and, to be, and be honest. And that has been a problem for Millie all along, not just while you've had her, correct? As far as lying? Yes. So, um, I would say about little things, um, brushing her hair. But you don't know her history other than the time she has been with you, correct? I do not know. No. And it's fair to say that great, great grandma has a great deal of influence on Millie, correct? I would say while she was living with her. And Millie and her great-grandmother would have conversations, isn't that correct? I'm not privy to the conversations they had. But you were privy to the results of those conversations, weren't you? You were privy to the fact that... Yeah, you know, Well, the results of, of the conversations with, with Millie, with her grandmother, how Millie acted when she was back home. That's what you're getting to. Yes, I'll, I'll rephrase. Okay, thank you. Your daughter, Millie, had problems with lying. Yes. You say about little things. Little things, lying. yes. She also had a problem with doing what her grandmother told her she could do and you told her she could not do, correct? Uh, can you give me an example? I uh, know I can't give you an example. I'm asking you a question. 
isn't it true that her grandmother would tell her things that you then would object to? Oh, yes, I thought you meant telling her she could do something and I was telling her she couldn't do something. You had, you had issues with what was going on with her grandmother. Yes, there was a few things I had issues with. And uh, in fact, those were discussed with Donna Wazork and Donna Wazork being the therapist. Mm -hmm. And there were requests that when Millie was with her great grandmother or her mother during the visitation period with her mother, excuse me, that they have appropriate conversations, that they not engage in inappropriate conversations. Well, I can't, um, are you saying when she visitations with Tessa? Yes. Millie did not have any visitations once she moved in with me, so I you can't don't know that. About that. But no, I definitely, you know, asked Peggy to have, you know, be mindful of when Millie was around and what was said in front of her. And in fact, she was telling things about both the Rosenbaums and Layla's, Millie and Layla's family. I, I don't, I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure. Okay. What was it that you were seeing that caused you to tell Peggy that you did not want her having these conversations with her? Um, one of them was um, saying that the only reason I wanted Millie to come and live with me was so the two younger sisters would stay with me. And that you knew to be a lie. It was because I said yes you know, from the night Layla died and several times after that for Millie to come live with us. So to your knowledge, Peggy, if Peggy did in fact tell her that, she I, lied. Yeah. Well, I don't know if Peggy is, I can't say that Peggy was lying because I don't know if she knew um, until much later into this process and Millie was living with me that I had mentioned all the times that I wanted Millie to come be with us and she seemed surprised. So I don't know when she said those things. I just know that I had a problem with her saying that to Millie. One of the treatment goals was to significantly reduce the frequency or eliminate lying altogether, wasn't it? No parent wants her child to lie, so yes, that was absolutely a goal. Yes. Yes. The answer. Yes. Yes. And um, she was getting in trouble at school for lying, correct? <gasps> Once, twice maybe. She was getting in trouble at school. Is that a yes? Yes. Now. She would, you would hear what she had to say to Donna Wazork. Not all the time. No, some, I was there for some sessions and other sessions they were not. But you me. were there for some sessions. Some of them, yes. And um, it's true that one day you felt she made some statements that caused you to follow Donna Wazork out the door and tell her that you had concerns that some of the memories M Millie was having were not true, were not correct. I remember saying that I was under the impression something different happened. But again, I had no knowledge of specifically what happened. So I, every, every time the sessions were over, I went outside with Donna to, to recap. Okay, well, I'm asking you a question, a very specific question. Did you go outside and say to Donna Wazork that you were concerned the memories Millie was speaking about were not true? Did you on that one day do that? I don't remember specifically that day, but it is, it is possible, yes. It's possible. Yes, absolutely. There also were instances that Donna and you discussed where you felt that she made up her own past experiences, correct? Yes. And you don't know really how she was at age three or four. You just no. know her from, from six. Mm -hmm. So you don't know what her history was for lying back then. No, I do not. I'm going to show you what I. I'm going to show you what I've marked as Defendant's Exhibit 15, and ask you if you can identify this. Yes, that is a picture of Carly and Millie at um, the girls' birthday party at my house for Hannah and Carly. I would tender Defendant's Exhibit 15 into evidence, Your Honor, at this time. No objection. May I publish? Okay. If we could get the lights, I would appreciate that.
Is this an accurate picture of Millie at what age? Um, that would have been, that was a girl's first and second birthday, so she would have been six. So who would she have been living with at the time? Peggy Banks. Okay. And uh, these bruises we see on her legs, what, uh, did you question anybody about them? No. Did you uh, t report them to defects? No. Thank you, I'm looking for on this picture. show you defendants 14 and see if you can identify that for us. That is a picture in one of her classmates, of Millie in one of her classmates. Um, is this a bump on her head? No. It's not? No. You didn't report that to anyone? No. And she was adopted at them, so I don't need to report it to anyone if there was a, a bump. Okay, but as, as there was, if there was a bump, um, isn't it true that what we're seeing is not, is in fact highlight, the highlight caused by the light? Well, I'm not sure what, I don't see anything on there, so I'm not sure. The light colored, if I may. Yes. I'm not sure you're This right here is caused by the light, isn't it? Okay. This is the light bouncing off of her, isn't it? Okay, yeah. I didn't have for it. Oh, one last question. I'm going to show you what's going on with the pen 16. Can you identify this picture for us? Yes, that is um, Hannah and um, a family friend. And uh, Hannah is, again, just for the record, the child that was named Mercy, yes. correct? Um, at this time, Your Honor, I would tender into uh, evidence defendants exhibit 16. Can you understand to Robinson? And And family friend? Yes. Your Honor, this goes to and to lineage and to show um, certainly some of the features of the child that are similar to the f features in Layla. And um, just want to show them at the same age as Layla. Well, the relevant standard is not high. I'll admit it, what it's worth. Thank you, Your Honor. What age, if I may, Your Honor, if you, you're admitting defendant 16, to, may I publish? What age is this picture of Hannah? I don't remember specifically when it was taken. I would say maybe a little less than a year. A little less than a year. Maybe, you know, somewhere right around her first birthday. And she looks different now, doesn't she? She's older. And her face has grown out. Mm -hmm. She's grown out of the baby fat in her face. Well, she's st no, she's she still <laughs> she still has chubby cheeks. But she's she doesn't have cheeks that look like this right now, do they? It might be slightly different. Thank you. I have nothing further. Would you like the lights back on? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Based on your experience with now parenting um, young children, do young children sometimes lie? Yes. And. When Millie um, would tell you lies, those would be about little things, as you said. Yes. Um, and your concerns regarding some of the things that either Millie said, that's not necessarily the same thing as them being untrue, is it? Okay, exactly. Yes. Now, Millie got in trouble, I believe you indicated, maybe two times for lying at school. Mm -hmm. uh, what grade is Millie in now? Uh, she'll be going into second grade. Second grade. Second or third? No, she's going in the second. Second. Mm -hmm. So she's been in school kindergarten, mm -hmm. first grade, mm -hmm. second grade. She's going in the second grade, and she's gotten in trouble twice for lying. That yes, specifically. Mm -hmm. And what were those? Um, um, the only one that I remember specifically was um, something to do with classwork, and she was supposed to be going and doing classwork. She grabbed um, one of the classroom iPads and was in with another group. 
that she was supposed to be um, she was supposed to be in a different group and she um, was saying that she didn't know that she was supposed to be in that group in a different group than where she was and so the teacher was like I know I told you so you do know and she, and she like the teacher said that's when it was so in all those three years that was the lie she got in the ones that I can yeah that come to mind too and when Millie pushed Hannah um, did Hannah have any injuries she might have had a she might have had a bump anything that you had to take her to the hospital for no. um, do you do the siblings sometimes fight yes Uh, put on the overhead what's been marked as states exhibit 78. Did Millie ever come back from Peggy Banks's home with that type of bruise? No. If you had seen that type of bruise on Millie when she came home from Pe Peggy Banks's, would you have taken her to the hospital? Yes. Would you have made a report? Yes. Would you have been concerned? Yes. And I'll show you what's been previously marked as states exhibit 80. Did Millie ever come from Peggy Banks with injuries like that? No. Has Millie ever had a type of injury like that in your care? No. Had you ever, if you had ever seen an injury like that on Millie or any of your other children, would you have been concerned? Absolutely. Would you have made a report? Absolutely. Would you have taken them to the hospital? Absolutely. So all the questions I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any objections to this witness being excused? No, you're on.